Hello everyone. So hopefully you've done the exam number two, which means that we are officially halfway through this semester. Yay! Um, so we've already done chapters one, two, and three, and you had your first exam. You've had chapters four, five, and six. You've had your second exam. Now we're going to do seven, eight, and nine. Um, and the way, if I can make myself small, there we go. Um, before I even get into it with chapter seven, um, it's going to be looking at do, 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 thinking language and intelligence. And so today we're going to talk about thinking. Tomorrow we're going to talk about language. And then on the last day we're going to talk about intelligence. But as you will see on your review guide for it, today all that we're going to be talking about with thinking, there's just seven things that you are going to need to know for the next exam. So please make sure that you're looking at that review guide that's up on Schoology. Um, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail when we get to those seven things, but I'm going to talk about everything for thinking today. But let's get right into it. Um, I'm going to make my little image of myself disappear. And we're going to get into it. So as I mentioned, we're into chapter seven. Chapter 7 covers kind of three main things, and these all have to do with what we know as cognitive psychology, but it's looking at thinking, language, and learning. And so today, it's going to be talking about thinking, what thinking is and all the different ways that we think. Because um, we've talked about learning, we've talked about memory, but then how we use that, how we think about the world is so complex. Um, and this whole category of thinking, learning, um, and intelligence has to do with a field of psychology known as cognitive psychology. And this is, again, it's looking at how we think, how we process information, how we use language, and how we problem solve, which is huge. Um, and as you saw for the review guide, one of the very first things that you need to know is the definition of thinking. And for the sake of this class, it's the process of representing and manipulating information in our mind. So we already kind of know um, about how memory works, but then how we take that information, how we use that information, how we represent that information um, is what we refer to as thinking. So you can have all these memories, but then how you actually use those memories go into thinking, which is in a more broader term, cognitive psychology. And a lot of times when we think about how we represent information, uh, we have what we call mental images. And so this is just a mental picture or representation of an object or an event. So if I told you to think about a house, you know, what do you see in your mind? Is it that stereotypical, you know, it has the windows, it has the roof, usually it's stereotypically colored red for some reason with childhood. Um, that's a mental image. Um, and then we also have these concepts. So again, it's not so much a mental image as it is a category or classification of an object, an event, an idea um, on the basis of their common features or properties. So one thing that I always love doing in class is I say, okay, what makes a bird a bird? What does a bird need to have? Um, and a lot of times people will say, oh, well, it needs wings. It needs a beak. Um, a lot of times you say, oh, it needs to fly. Ah, but, you know, what about penguins? They can't fly, but they're still birds. So we have this category of there's certain features. And when we're looking at these concepts, there's different types. We have logical concepts and we have natural concepts. Logical concepts are more, they have set rules, essentially. Um, so, you know, you see the example right there. Um, is, I should know this, it's not linear, oh boy, is that a hyperbole? I should know this, I'm not a math teacher as you can tell, um, but the whole y equals x plus y, um, no, y equals negative x squared plus 4x, um, essentially that is the rule that anything on this line, any of these points, if you plug in x and y, they will fall into this equation. Um, quadratic equation, wow, it's right there. So the quadratic equation, it teaches us that with that equation, you know, 
anything if you plug in like if we look here you have one and three if you plug in one and three in here it'll solve that equation um, so that's just one of the things where it's very clearly defined anything that will solve that equation will fall on that line and subsequently anything that falls on this line will solve that equation there are no exceptions to that rule that is a very logical concept natural concepts on the other hand are more fuzzy so if i was to say you know how would you define justice how would you define freedom you know what does it mean to be honest what is a lie it, there's more fuzziness to defining that. So some people might say, oh, well, you know, freedom is being able to do whatever you want. Other people would say, you know, freedom comes at a cost. You know, you have to earn freedom. So it's different definitions for different people. It's more fuzzy. It's more natural concepts. Uh, so you will need to remember what a logical concept is for the sake of the exam. But knowing the difference between a logical and a natural concept will help you in this class. All right, problem solving techniques. Um, problem solving, again, it's a cognitive process. It's a way that we think um, in order to find a solution. So, you know, I give you a problem. How you come up with the solution can vary. There's all sorts of different ways. One of the ways that I wish happened more often was this whole idea of insight learning. And this is something, again, that you will need to know on the exam. And insight learning is when you just, it just suddenly hits. You're just suddenly like, oh, that's the answer. Um, so you think about it over and over again, and then all of a sudden it just hits you. That's insight learning. It's like a light bulb going off. So insight learning, it's when, you know, those neural connections in your brain, they suddenly connect in such a way that the solution just suddenly becomes available to you. That's insight learning. This is a little different from trial and error. This is what sometimes when people are getting frustrated, they'll start doing. Well, you just start, you know, throwing various solutions out there and you try to see what hits. It's the hit or miss approach. So that's trial and error. It kind of defines itself. Um, you're trying to figure out, you know, the solution to a math problem. You're just going to start putting random numbers into a calculator and you're going to keep going until you get the solution. Sometimes it works. Um, and one thing that should be known about this problem solving is all of these different techniques have their place. Some are quicker than others. Again, insight is very quick when it hits you. Um, trial and error um, can be very good for things like the SAT. When you get multiple choice and you are solving for X, like just plug in those options, um, especially if you have a calculator, which I believe you are given on the SAT. Um, so that's trial or error. We also have algorithms. So algorithms is when you have very specific steps. Um, and so it's like solving a Rubik's Cube. A lot of people don't realize that solving a Rubik's, Rubik's Cube, sorry, is algorithms. It says, you know, you look at your Rubik's Cube, um, which, well, you guys didn't get to see Lucy jumping up. All right. Um, solving a Rubik's Cube, you look at your Rubik's Cube. Hopefully you know what a Rubik's Cube is. Um, and if it looks a certain way, you follow a certain step. And then when it looks like when you have all the corners, and then when all the corners are the same color, you go to the next step where, you know, it's move one up and then two over. And if you follow those exact steps, you will get the answer. You will solve the Rubik's Cube. Um, another thing, again, quadratic formula. Wasn't that what they said the other thing was? I might have lied about saying that was quadratic uh, formula. So this whole thing, if you have, you know, B, A, C, you plug that in, it will give you X. Every single time, 100% of the time. So that's an algorithm. It's a very specific set of rules. And if you follow those very specific set of rules, you'll get the answer. This is a little different from a working algorithm. With a working algorithm, it's more the general set of guidelines for solving a problem. And if you follow them, yeah, for the most part, part, you'll be in the ballpark of the answer. But it doesn't necessarily work. Um, and this is, unfortunately, um, 
the activity that we were going to do in class, and so I'm sorry, that involved tacos that I know so many of you were so excited about making tacos. But we were going to do an example of a working algorithm where I was going to give you a recipe for making a stereotypical taco, and then you guys were going to compete. And the whole idea, especially with cooking, is you get a set of recipes um, like this rotisserie chicken rub that you can do. Um, and this is one of the psychology professors um, at Warwick. Um, and so you can follow it and you can cook it. And for the most part, you know, you'll get, you know, the rotisserie chicken. But there's always room for error. Um, and so that's something to know for working algorithms. And again, when we were going to be making tacos in class, you know, I might say, you know, combine beef, sour cream, lettuce, tomato. How much you have of each could vary. Like, I'm someone that likes a lot of sour cream and cheese, not so much lettuce and tomato. It's still a taco, but it varies. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of a working algorithm. Um, so I apologize that we are unable to do that this year in class. Um, again, if we do meet up this year, we're going to make tacos. Uh, but that is a working algorithm where there's a general set of guidelines, you know, like a recipe. You follow that recipe, but, you know, you might add a little bit of more of one thing, a little less of something else. Your cooking time might be a little off. Your oven might be, you know, not as warm. Um, and so it might not necessarily work out. Um, and if any of you have gotten to see some of the things that I've tried to create while cooking, uh, you would know that sometimes you don't quite get the correct solution. Um, but those are algorithms. And the difference between a algorithm versus a what we would call a working algorithm. Oops. Then we have heuristics. Heuristics are just a fancy way of saying a shortcut. When we're using heuristics, we're using a shortcut. Our brains are lazy, in a sense. They like shortcuts. They like to use what have worked before. Um, but the issue with using heuristics, the issue with using shortcuts is, yes, maybe it did, you know, work last time in problem, in problem solving or solving a problem, does not necessarily mean that it's going to work. Um, and there are some different examples of heuristics, um, and one in particular that you will need to know for the exam. But here are some of them. So there's the means end heuristic. This is when you look at a situation and you compare where we are to where we want to be, and then you make a plan. So you look at, okay, where am I now? Where do I want to be? How do I get there? Um, and with this, you can do something that's known as sub-goals. Um, so when you are trying to achieve a goal, sometimes the goal can look a little far off. And so we set these sub-goals, which is breaking down a problem. So that is another thing that you will need to know on the exam. It's not necessarily in the PowerPoints, but it's why I'm saying it right now. A sub-goal is breaking down a problem into smaller pieces. Um, so, an example of this, let's say that you want to be a veterinarian. Right now you're in high school. So you try to figure out, okay, I want to be a veterinarian, that's going to take a while, let's break this down. Okay, first I need to graduate high school, then I need to go to college, then I need to go, you know, in college I need to go into a certain field, you know, veterinarian. Um, and then after that, you know, I need to get hired, you know, I need to do perhaps an internship. So it's breaking down every single step, looking at where you are now, and then looking at where you want to be and how to get there. Um, so there's also backward working heuristics. This is when you look at the solution and then you work backwards um, to see what evidence you have supports the solution. Um, so usually, you know, an example of this is, let's say that you've lost your keys. You would say, okay, what do you usually do when you lose your keys? You know, what happened last time you lost your keys? What worked? So it's looking at the solution that worked last time and working backwards. So these, again, they're all heuristics. They're all shortcuts. They don't necessarily mean that it'll work. It doesn't mean that if you, you know, think about the last time you lost your keys, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you 
work back from the last time you lost them, you'll find them again this time. But it does sometimes help. Ah, and this was a fun thing. Um, so this is an example of problem solving where you're applying mental strategies uh, to problem solving. And this is something where I'm going to be giving the solution at the end of the video. So you can always um, stop um, ahead of time. But I'm going to quickly show some examples. So there's the nine dot problem and the insight problem with the nine dot problem. And I'm going to show this very quickly. Again, I'm going to make these videos shorter, I swear. Here we go. There's nine dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight, nine. So you have nine dots, and the rule is that you can draw no more than four lines that connect all the dots without lifting your pencil, or pen, or marker, um, and without, well, yeah, without lifting your pen, they have to be straight lines. So, for example, you can go one, two, three, four. Oh, no, I didn't get it through all the dots. I'll give one more example to make sure people know. Again, I'll be giving the answer at the end of this video because I don't want to just give it away. But let's say, okay, well, let's see if I go one, two, three, four. Oh, no, I missed the dot in the middle. So it's four lines without picking up your pen or pencil or marker to go through all the dots. Again, I'll be giving the answer to that one at the end of this video for those that want to know and for those that don't want to know you can pause at the end of the video so that's just one example um, and this is applying different mental strategies which i'm going to talk about those mental strategies at the end of the video and then ah oh, that's right the insight one doesn't come up but that's okay because i'm prepared the insight one has to do with a triangle which looks like ooh, this two three okay there we go triangle with a bunch of dots um you can only move three of the dots i hope i didn't make too many i don't think i did i might have messed this one up you can only move three of the dots and you have to make the triangle facing upwards actually yeah i did mess it up boop Yes, you move three of the dots and you have to make the triangle that looks like that upside down. So turning from this to this, and you can only move three of the dots. So as an example, I might say, okay, well, I'll move the top one here and then that one. You get the idea. Again, I might have messed that one up a little bit, but that's okay. I'll make the other one better. So feel free to pause the video and try at least the nine dot problem. That one's a lot more fun. I think I messed up the downward facing triangle one, so I apologize for that because I feel like there's another row. Um, there's a ton of these on the internet, but the nine dot problem one's fun. I'm going to give the answer to that one at the end of the video. But we're going to keep going on, and I'm going to make myself disappear again. So barriers to effective problem solving. So when you use heuristics you have to be careful because there's a lot of things that can affect your well coming to the right solution um, and one of those is a mental set so it's a tendency to rely on strategies that have worked in similar situations in the past but might not be appropriate to the present solution so it's just saying that you know if something worked once you are far more likely to do that again. I mean, that goes back to when we talked about learning and positive reinforcement um, or just any form of reinforcement. You know, if it worked, if it was pleasant, if you got what you wanted, you're more likely to do that behavior. So with this, you know, if something worked before, you're more likely to do that again. But that does not necessarily mean that it's going to work in this situation. And the example that's kind of shown on this is someone looking for um, their lost keys. Again, classic example. And let's say that the last time you lost your keys, there we go. The last time you lost your keys, you you know found it in your bag. 
And so the next time you lose your keys, you look in your bag and it's not there. And you're like, well, did I really look in my bag? You look in your bag and again, okay, no, it's not actually there. Well, wait, 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 I didn't check the little part of my bag. And you just keep going back and checking your bag. You keep thinking, well, you know, that's where it was last time. It must be here this time. That's a mental set. Um, because it worked that one time, because the one time you lost your keys, it was in your bag, you're going to assume, you know, that that's the appropriate place to look the next time you lose them. We also have this idea of functional fixedness. Um, and I'm going to show there will be another video um, on Schoology that shows the two-string problem. Um, so you'll be able to watch that. But essentially the idea of functional fixedness, and this is another thing that you will need to know for the exam, is it's unable to realize that you can use an object in unique ways. So I'm not going to talk about the two string problem um, because it shows a solution in the other video, but the two candle uh, problem, or sorry, the box candle problem, is the whole idea that you have a box of matches, you have two thumbtacks, and you have a candle and you need to come up with a way to have the candle on the wall in such a way that if you light it the wax won't get on the floor and essentially what you need to do and sorry I'm spoiling this one but it's not as fun as the other one is you empty out the matchbox you use the thumbtacks to put the matchbox on the wall and then you put the candle in the matchbox. A lot of people don't think of that initially because they think, oh, it's just a box of matches. What can I use the matches for? They forget that you can also use the box. So again, functional fixes is, is just that idea that, well, I'm going to use myself as an example. A lot of people don't like the fact that I drive a hearse because they have this functional fixedness that a hearse can only be used for one purpose and one purpose only. But if you can get past functional fixedness and realize that hearses are actually amazing cars, um, then you have an awesome car. But that's an idea, the idea of functional fixedness. There, a specific object has a specific purpose, and you can't use it for anything else. But when you break that functional fixedness, a whole world of opportunities um, come about. So don't fall for functional fixedness. Oop. Yeah, they were, well, really quickly. Yeah, so you can see the example you use the matchbox and the thumbtack. A lot of people don't think to use the matchbox. All right, another thing that can happen, thing known as confirmation bias. We have talked about this before in class. Um, it's the whole idea that you kind of already have this idea of your head about what's right and what's wrong. And once you have that idea, you're going to pay attention to things that confirm your belief and kind of disregard things that don't confirm your belief. Um, and again, this can happen all the time with, like the example that's being put up here, is a jury. It, just seeing a person that's been accused of a crime, they'll say, oh, you know, I know this type. I see what this person's like. You know, this person looks like someone that would steal. They must be guilty. That's a confirmation bias. Now you're only going to be listening to it's like, oh, you know, see... Um, that, you know, when he was younger, he stole from a store. See, that's proof that he stole again. Like, that, no, that's not proof. Um, and then they might say, oh, well, you know, what about all those other times that he's gone into a store and hasn't stolen? Oh, well, you know, that store probably didn't have what the person wanted to steal. Like, they'll explain away contradictory evidence. Um, and you have to be very, very careful with confirmation bias. Um, because it's very, very easy it's a fall for it. I mean, it still happens with adults all the time. You see it everywhere where we pay attention to things that confirm what we think and we ignore things that don't. Um, and teeny little rant time. I swear this won't take that long. I can put my face up. Um, but just remember that when you are listening, like when it comes to making your own decisions and listening to the information that's out there, it is important to hear both sides of the story. Because when we aren't listening to both sides of the story, it's confirmation bias. Um, and this is why I always try to make sure that I am friends with people that have different opinions. Um, we don't agree on everything, but that's fine. Because I get to see different opinions. Um, when you surround yourself 
with people that are like-minded, it is fun. And, you know, you should have friends that have similar interests. But when you're too like-minded, it's very easy to fall for confirmation bias, where all you're thinking about, all you're focusing about is, you know, information that proves that you're right. And you're not looking at information or different opinions out there that might be looking at, you know, the contrary, that you might be wrong. Um, so that's just me and my, my teeny little uh, PSA. Um, don't fall for confirmation bias. Okay, back to this. You, you other know, things that affect our thinking. You have the representativeness heuristic. Um, this is another thing that you will need to know on the exam. And we only got one more thing after this that you need to know for the exam. The rep well, for this video. The representativeness heuristic, again, is a shortcut, because that's all we mean when we say shortcut, where you think that some sample that you've had, some interaction you've had, represents the entire population. So that's why it's a representative heuristic. It is you believe that the entire population of something is represented by this one thing, because it's a, it's an easy shortcut. Um, classic example of this is, let's say that somebody has a negative experience with someone that happens to be of a minority. They will then say, oh, you know, people of this minority are like this. You know, they're all the same. That's a representative heuristic. It's also racist. Um, it's the whole idea of, oh, this one person that just happened to be of this race acted a certain way, therefore everyone of that race must act that way. Completely false, um, but a lot of us fall for it because it's quicker. It helps us make snap judgments. Do not fall for that. That's a representative heuristic. And then we have availability heuristic. This is very similar, but instead of representativeness, it has to do with the availability of information. And it's the whole idea that when you don't have all the information out there, it can skew how you see and interpret information. Again, because this is all about thinking. Um, a classic example about this is that a lot of people are scared to fly because they think it's dangerous because the only information they see about planes are plane crashes. You know, you're not going to see a headline in the news that says, oh, a plane took off and landed perfectly fine, everyone clapped. That doesn't make a headline. All of the times that we hear about planes is when they've crashed. And so because that's the only available information out there, we tend to think, oh, you know, planes are really dangerous because remember in like that one newspaper article where, you know, 128 people died. Oh, my God. You know, they don't pay attention to all the other times when a plane took off and landed. No one died because they didn't have um, access or availability to that information. So it can also skew our results. Ah, Creativity. This is a wonderful form of thinking. It's something that I think we don't do as often as we should. I think it should be expressed more in school, and I think that it is. Um, but it's a form of thinking that leads to original, practical, and meaningful solutions to problems, or it just generates new ideas or artistic expressions. This is something I say all the time, that creativity, like the world is not going to change if we all think, you know, the same way as people have always thought. Having a unique way of seeing the world, having a unique way of thinking is what changes the world and makes it better. Um, so creativity, I think, is commonly overlooked. A lot of people think, oh, it's just a way of expressing yourself and drawing and, you know, music. It's fun. It's a pastime. And yes, while that is true, Creativity serves so much bigger of a purpose. Um, and we are going to be doing a little practice of creativity. You'll see it um, in Schoology. But creativity is so important and being able to think in a creative way and not just doing things the way it's always been done because then we don't grow. Um, but that's what we mean by creativity and that's what we define it as. Um, and then this goes into, you know, similar to what I was just saying, a lot of times we're not taught to tap into our creative potential. And this has to do with the very last thing that you will need to know um, for this section on the exam, which has to do with divergent versus convergent thinking. 
And so a lot of times, um, what we're taught to do is convergent thinking. It's this whole idea that there is one single answer to a problem. So, you know, there's a problem out there. Oh, what do I need to do? Um, you know, I'm about to finish high school. What's the option? Oh, I have to go to college. Um, that was a huge thing that was stressed when I was younger. You know, as soon as you finish high school, you have to go to college. The only way to get a job is you have to go to college. It's a convergent way of thinking. And while college is wonderful, and it is, you know, most likely the solution for some people, that does not mean that it's right for everyone, that it's not the perfect fit for everyone. I mean, you see all the times that there are people that didn't go to college and they are just as successful as those that do. Um, similarly, you see people that don't go to college that weren't successful and people that did go to college that weren't successful. Um, but what I'm trying to get to is, you know, to think that there's only one solution, to think that, oh, as soon as I'm finished with this, this is what I have to do. It's just, it's very closed minded. And a lot of times, unless you're doing like math problems, um, there are different solutions to a single problem. And so what we need to be is divergent thinkers. thinkers. Um, so it's when you're looking at all the different possible solutions. So, okay, I'm about to graduate high school. Um, I could go into a trade. I could go into a business. I could go to college. Um, I could do an internship. Like, th the possibilities are endless. Um, and to think of all the different possibilities before coming to, to a conclusion is very important. Um, so remembering the difference, divergent thinking, it's all different answers. Um, but for the sake of this exam coming up, convergent thinking is when all of the thoughts are converging into one single answer. And so just quickly going over, we just talked about, um, we talked about thinking, how we think, how thinking works, and there's all sorts of different things. There's mental images, which is a way that we think about things in our head. So again, if I tell you think about a house, what pops into your mind? We have concepts where they can be either logical or natural. And so logical concepts are those that have very, very strict rules, whereas natural ones are kind of that fuzzy area. And then we have problem solving, where there's so many different ways that we can solve problems. Um, there's algorithms, which are these steps that we can take, but there's also these heuristics, um, which are very, very useful. I mean, we do shortcuts all the time because, you know, sometimes we don't have the time to, you know, really sit down and think things out. So heuristics have their place, but you have to be careful um, because it does not guarantee the right solution. And then we have things like mental sets and functional fixedness. So that whole idea of, you know, you can only use a certain thing a certain way. And we talked about decision making, so what helps us make decisions, how we can have confirmation biases, um, the representativeness heuristics and availability heuristics, which you need to be careful about. And then we talked about creativity and what creativity truly is um, and how it's such an important thing. But that is it for the first part. And so we will come back tomorrow to talk about language. Um, and then we'll finish with intelligence. One last thing, because uh, I totally didn't forget. So I mentioned, for those that wanted to know the solution to the nine point problem or the nine dot problem, so four lines without picking up your marker that go through all nine dots. And this goes into what we were saying at the very end of this thing. Um, about, and I'm going to make this bigger, because why not? You guys don't get to see my face as much. Um, and this goes into creativity. And again, convert thinking, divergent thinking, more importantly, and not falling to functional fixedness. But more importantly, remembering not to forget to think outside the box. So the way to do this, if I can recall correctly, uh-oh. You get to see my thinking. All right. One. I might have to edit this. One. Two. 
two. Oh, I remember it now. Okay. <laughs> you just see my thought process. But that's okay. The way that you do it, and you know, I, I did this, so you guys don't feel bad when uh, it took you a while to figure it out. All right, one, two, three, four. So, oh god, that looks awful on this. But the thing to remember is that you are not confined within the box. You have to think outside. Um, which, again, goes to the whole idea of creativity. A lot of times people feel like because there's these nine dots that form this little square, they think that they have to stay within the square. I mean, you don't have to. And I'm sorry that took me a while to figure it out. But yeah, one, two, three, and four. And you go through all the dots. Uh, you sat on your friends. It's a lot of fun. Sorry about that. So there we go. Now we are done with that. And then tomorrow we will look at language. language.